I would, like, I would now like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Byron Adams. Mr. Adams is 76 years old, currently resides in Chickamauga, Georgia with his wife, Carolyn. He was raised in the small town of Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, and he's a graduate of Rossville High School, class of 1966, along with his wife. He went to Middle Tennessee State University in 1966, and in March 1968, he entered the Army. In October of that same year, Byron was assigned to Vietnam, where he served in combat in D Company 3rd Battalion of the 8th Infantry Regiment, 4th Division. During this time, his service led him to earn the Combat Infantry Badge, Purple Heart, and Army Commendation. Upon his return to the States, he re-entered and graduated college at MTSU. As a career, Mr. Adams worked as an insurance claims representative and he subsequently became disabled due to the wounds he has sustained during combat. Currently, he is a member of Valley View Baptist Church where he teaches a Sunday school class of young adults. Mr. Adams, we welcome you home and we welcome you to Ridgeland High School. probably not catch and that's probably good so <laughs> who am I well he told who I am um, it's kind of like coming home here this is part of the old Rossville High School so as he pointed out I graduated in 66 for a lot of you that's the dark ages um, but it was great time to go to high school you are truly blessed with a great high school here. I can see the continuation. I had great teachers. The teachers I have met here are fabulous. So you're very fortunate. Um, composite of my life. He pretty well described my life uh, in those brief words. But what I did, I was drafted. Now that's a word you may not be familiar with. Uh, we needed man. We needed manpower, and I. I'm sorry if you can't hear me. I'll raise that volume. Um, a, a draft letter said uh, greetings. That's where it started, and I was inducted into the military. I have no regrets with that. Your country calls, you go. And I think we're going to have a time where hmm, some of you may get that letter. I don't know. So anyhow, I serve with incredible people. Now, service. My wife's dad was drafted in the Second War. He was in his 30s. He served in the infantry just as I did. He, he went to Europe. Um, he, he took some serious wounds. These are done in defense of our country. Why do we serve? So that you can have a good life. So that you can raise a family. So that you can go to church and worship. These are things that we feel were important to save this country. Uh, I'm going to ask you to study your history and you'll understand why 
This country and at times came close to falling apart, but men and women stepped up and served, and that's what's important. Now, I have terrible handwriting, so I'm trying to read my notes here. Um, so anyhow, I went to Vietnam October 1968. I would say that's probably a few days before some of you were born. Um, I was a ripe old age of 20. Now here's one of the ironical things. I had never even been in a fist fight in my life. I wound up in a hand-picked unit in Vietnam. We did things that you would probably never understand. Um, what type of infantry were we? We would go out into the Central Highlands six to eight weeks at a time, come in for two days and right back out. Hey, that's without a bath during that time period. So, uh, yeah, they, they, they were glad to hose us down when we came in for a few days. We served because we were called to serve. And that's what is important. Now, we have not just the Army who defends this country. We have the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force. I was speaking to an Air Force veteran a little bit ago, and I simply said, thank you. The Air Force bailed us out several times in those mountains over in South Vietnam. So we have great branches. We also have the Coast Guard, a little known uh, group that are, do a big work. So let me just encourage you to look at these branches. Some of you are where I was many years ago. Think about your future. Uh, I'm very strong on commitment. Um, Let's say you joined. You've got to, you don't have to join the infantry. Uh, that's what they, they gave me when I uh, was drafted. But if you join, you get different jobs that you can do. These jobs you can carry as experience into life with future jobs that you may have. Um, so these branches mean a lot. Now, like I say, we kid each other. But we appreciate each other. Now, of interest, I'm going to go back to my unit. Delta Company, 3rd Battalion, 8th Infantry. We've had reunions, and those are fun. Because I served with incredible men. We learned at one reunion, my company commander was there, Milton C. Daughtery. He was special forces, we were not. This was his third tour when he got a hold of us. And he told us then, he said, I'm gonna tell you something you don't know. I was sent back to handpick 100 men. You are one of 100. Whoa, that was a joke. So we served well. Now. Life goes on in different ways. Um, holidays. Thanksgiving of 68 was uh, becoming a very depressing day. You know, I'm not home. But all of a sudden, the sky was full of helicopters. And they brought in food. What got me? Uh, they had a big cooler of ice cream. Now, the temperature was only about 115, so we ate that first. Uh, other, th other food and what have you. But the thing I remember most, they said a little dish of nuts out there, like it was, you know, your home. And that, I always remember those nuts. <laughs> Christmas. Moms, you don't ever tell your mom and dad what you're doing. Uh, one, they couldn't handle it. So you just kind of, I would just kind of write my mom and make, you know, hey, I'm just a little busy. If I, you don't hear from me for a little bit, just a little busy over here. So others wrote their moms and dads the same way. One mother sent her son a four foot aluminum Christmas tree. She had no idea what he was doing or where he was at. So being a bunch of grunts with warped humor, we set that tree up somewhere in the jungles, 
We decorated it with whatever we took an ocean to decorate it with, and we left it sitting there. And I'd often wondered when the enemy came by and looked at it, what they thought. I'm hoping that little thing is sitting there to this day, but I doubt it. So, you know, the important thing is don't let your families know when you're in harm's way. Now, another thing that we had that was difficult, not only the enemy, we were fighting the North Vietnamese, um, there was Chinese in there fighting us as well. But the um, wildlife, you don't think about wildlife when you're, you're in combat. We was in the jungles. They had Bengal tigers there. Our Alpha Company lost several men to Bengals. We had a man seriously hurt by a Bengal. Those are big cats. Uh, their, their paw prints are hard to describe in size, but um, there's nothing more chilling than to hear one roar in the middle of the night when you just lay down. There were snakes. The one snake that, that drove the most fear was called a little green snake called a bamboo viper. If it bit you, you had five minutes to live. There was no venom that could help you. So, you know, it was not just the enemy, but it was the wildlife. But then there were some humorous things that happened. We were moving through the jungle one time, and all of a sudden I had a small monkey drop down on my shoulder. It jumped to the man in front of me, jumped to the man in front of him, and then grabbed a vine and it was gone. So, you know, there's little crazy things that, that you do that uh, you remember. Um, mail, they try to get mail to us as often as possible. But there's one mail situation that I would like to, to tell about. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to be from Georgia. And a couple of men in my uh, uh, squad were from Pennsylvania. Well, we would dig a different fighting position every night wherever we were at. And they'd take a little bitty Pennsylvania flag and stick it in the ground. And um, the governor of Georgia at the time, I wrote him a letter. Dear Governor Lester, there are Yankees amongst us. And uh, yeah, I did that. And I said, I have to look at a Yankee flag every night. Now, we, that's humor to us out in the field. I figured, what's the worst they can do? Send me to Vietnam and put me in the infantry? That's where I'm at and what I'm doing. About three weeks later, Chopper come out with mail. I got a package. And I pulled that open, and it was a Georgia state flag. The old Georgia state flag had a lot of red in it. And I'm thinking, every sniper in the world is zeroed on me. So I stuffed that thing back in. Our barrack sergeant was from Atlanta. I had it sent back to him, and he flew the Georgia state flag in South Vietnam. I've got a picture of it. I'm proud of that. It, your homeland is what's so uh, important to you. Um, there are things that happen, and the question that is often asked to me, so I'll go ahead and answer it. Yes, had it killed me? You do that in the defense of yourself, the man on the left, the man on the right. It happens because they're trying to kill you. Um, so that is a question that people, that's usually the first question people ask at any time. So I thought I would just go ahead and meet that one right there. Um, in one of my patrols, and I spent quite a few of them, there were four man teams, we were caught in an ambush and we got, we were leaving and they ran us right into booby traps. I was wounded pretty bad and my squad leader was wounded pretty bad. We got each other out because that's what you do. You take care of one another. Um, now, I spent Christmas after I left that little wonderful tree and I had another little wound and I got to spend Christmas in the hospital in Pleiku. Now, that can be a downer, but let me talk about the nurses. They were wonderful. They took care of the grunts. And uh, I remember Christmas Eve, 
one nurse came in, set a chair in the middle four of us who had been out in the field for a while, and we talked all night about what we had done before we got into the Army and what we planned to do. A few days later, I was being discharged from the hospital. And as you are being discharged in the military, you sign in and out and what have you. And as I was getting ready to walk out the door, I put my boonie hat on. Now we, we, we had these hats, we had individualized hats. I put it on and the nurse broke down crying. I will never forget that. I looked at her and I said, ma'am, you okay? She said, y'all all come in here looking just alike. But when you put that hat on, I know where you're going back to. So, I cannot say enough about the nurses. Medics, oh boy, they were tremendous. They risked their own life to, to help the wounded. So, you know, I'm, I'm 20 years old and I'm seeing things that's beyond my imagination. I'm doing things beyond my imagination. But the whole time you think of your country, that's why we were there because our country needed us over there. Um, so as I mentioned, we have several branches of the service that all work together. Um, as I said, why are you sitting here? Because of the sacrifices that the military, be it wartime or peacetime, have done. They have provided you a safe place to grow up in your life and a safe place to go on beyond that. Um, okay, now if you want to see sacrifice, I don't know if any of you had a chance to go to Washington, D.C. We have the Vietnam Memorial up there. We call it the Wall. And the orders that the people were killed, the men were killed, and there's 10 women on the wall, there's over 58,000 names. There's other memorials to other branches at different times. I think it's important to see these memorials. They're not just there because there's space to put it. They're there because we care. We want you to know what the sacrifice is. And I will use that word several times. When you're in the military, even in peacetime, peace time, there was sacrifice. Um, all right, skipping over some of my notes here. Um, now, I wish to read something a group of us got together in uh, 2000 from my old infantry uh, uh, company we got together in chattanooga and we had a memorial of interest we had that memorial up on point park on lookout mountain there's a statue up there that i would encourage every one of you to go see tall statue and on the top of it are two men shaking hands one is a Union soldier, one is a Confederate soldier. It's the only statue like that that exists. And we had our memorial service at that statue. Now, we also had an honor guard. Now, this is before Richmond was in existence. The LFO honor guard provided the colors for us. So those things mean a lot to us. There's a memorial service. I'm going to read a paragraph from that service. We stand as men that came back with memories others will never understand, and rightfully so. To understand, one would have to have been with us. We stand with physical and mental scars. We stand as those who carry memories of our brothers who do not come back to the world. That's what we call the United States, the world. It is a deeper than honor paid for a day that gave all. Why we stand at this moment will not be understood by us. Now that's a question that we, we 
often raise for ourselves, how did I make it? And the guy next to me, not. So we ask ourselves that question, and we'll never properly get the answer. Um, our brothers who gave the complete sacrifice for each other and our nation to continue to be free will not be forgotten. We remember not for what they could have been, but for who they were. Little things about them that we remember. Um, a good friend of mine, he didn't make it, Steve Dundas. He was from Arizona. Steve had a faith, now of course that, the rock music in that time period was different from what y'all hear, but he had a favorite song he'd walk around singing. It's called Going Up Country by the Canned Heat. Now nah, look it up, you can find it. And I used to get so tickled at it. Steve was a great encourager. If he sensed somebody was down, he walked up to him and said, my man, these are things you remember. So we remember not for what they could have been, but for who they were. We see them in a moment of death, and it is a moment of life in which they smile at things only grunts can smile at. We stand here in their honor. We stand because we miss them. It is rare to say that we saw men at their best. That is what we saw, though. Not many can say that. No man standing here, no man we honor, wanted what we did, but we sacrificed. In the service, a verse was mentioned from, from the Bible, from the book of Luke. It was Luke 17, 10. So you also. So you also, when you have done everything, you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. And that's what military does. We have a duty to do. This beautiful structure here is because men and women did their duty. That is very important to remember. Now I am, as I indicated at the very beginning, I am a very strong advocate um, of military service. I've jokingly said the best thing that can happen is as you graduate from high school, with one hand you get the diploma, with the other hand you wave because the buses that take you to basic training are waiting outside. Um, I strongly believe in what we do to protect this country. I'm 76, hey, yeah, that's old, and I would agree with you there. Would I defend this country again? You better believe it. Am I as agile as I was at 20? No. But I love my country. And um, yeah, I'm very proud to be a Georgia, Georgia boy. Uh, in my platoon, there were six of us from Georgia, and uh, I don't know how that happened, but it was great. So, I'm very fortunate to be here. My family knows I need support. So, my pastor, my wife, my cousin, and, the, and one of the best yard rovers in the world sits right there. We had more fun in Rossville High School than we should have been allowed to. Um, yeah, and I will simply say we went out one night with 300 rolls of paper and we rolled yards. So uh, yeah, those were good days. So I have no regrets. Um, let me see if any of my notes I'm missing here. There are movies that you can watch that give an idea. For me, it would be We Were Soldiers. The book is very thick. But let me encourage you to watch that movie. It gives you an idea. It, it took place in the Idrain Valley in the Central Highlands. I fought in that valley later. Uh, it was not pleasant. How did we get around in those valleys? Well, one, we were soldiers, we walked. 
But we went in on what's called combat assaults out of helicopters. And what you pray for is uh, LZ or landing zone is a cold LZ. But if you're going in and the door gunner opens up, you know it's going to be a problem. So what you do, you get out of that chopper. Sometimes you jump out with your 100-pound rucksack on your back. Everything I had was on my back. Um, food. We have something called sea ration. Yeah, it's as bad as it sounds. But when you go three days without eating, you'll eat anything. Uh, our, our, the rations they have nowadays are delicate. See? So, you know, it, it's, it's a life that we spend. I will simply put it this way. March 1969, they put my battalion into Cambodia before we were authorized to do it, but they sent us. We lost three companies in four days of fighting. We were outnumbered 23 to 1. But it's what our country called us to do. I have no regrets, and that I will make clear. It's good to be home. This will always be wrathful to me. I think Eddie would agree, excuse me. Now, this old boy gets emotional sometimes. Let me simply add a postscript to this. You come back, to me memories, to me responses. Uh, I have a tremendous start of response. Best thing in the world, don't touch me on my back. Well, because I had been hand to hand. That was rough. I walked away, somebody didn't. The military has medals. Uh, the most important medal that I have is the combat infantry badge. It's a rifle on a blue background, and you get it by being in combat X number of days. Purple Heart. It amuses me that people say, oh, you won a Purple Heart. <clears throat> Let's stop right there. You don't go there to win that thing. You're awarded, uh, and what heck. But the one medal that really means something to me is the Army Commendation. It's just kind of a basic medal. Why was I given that, along with a few other men? As I said, I did a lot of four-man teams in those mountains, and we were way out one time, and we found this little hut in the middle of nowhere. One of the men had to check it out, so the other three of us just kind of spread out. I spotted three NVA coming out of the jungle line. Now, as I said, we were an unusual company. We had a blank check to do whatever we thought was best. We closed in on these three NVA. We had authorization to kill them, but we decided not to. And we just pointed it. We pointed our rifles at them and basically like this, drop your weapons, which they did. So we called for a chopper, we got prisoners. Chopper come out, we threw those three on there and we got out of Dodge because we've been compromised where we're at. A couple weeks later, my platoon sergeant came up to me and he said, Byron, you know those three y'all caught? They turned out to be high-ranking NBA officers. How many lives have we saved by capturing those officers and they talk freely? And so war is more than just having to shoot at people. It's trying to get the job done. So I stand here blessed. Blessed beyond anything I deserve. Now, you'll see a lot of veterans, when the national anthem is played, we salute because we're authorized to do that. Indoors, we'll remove our hats. Outdoors, we can keep it on, but that's protocol. We salute. When our flag goes by, when y'all play the national anthem, you'll see veterans at the stadium or what have you salute. Others will place their hand on their heart. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you.